Genie Park. Uh, we're at the Hastings entrance and it goes all the way through to Jack's Beach in Bitten. It's an amazing area that's been allowed to return to some of what it was before settlement. Um, this whole area was actually turned into farmland so we had cattle roaming through here but over the last 30 to 40 years it's been returned to the local council, Mornington Peninsula Shire and with a little bit of management and allowing nature to take over it's returned to some of its former glory. We're going to take a walk through the park and have a look at the environment that's inside. Lucas or swamp paper barks. We have here what's called a zonation habitat. So out beyond the eye line are actually mud flats where the seagrass uh, meadows exist. Then we have the mangroves, which are the far tall trees that you can see, and behind those, which are being sheltered, is actually the salt marsh. We have two different types of salt marsh plants here. We have shrubby salt marsh plants, the last word, right next to me here and you can see that they're covered in red tips at the moment, that's the beaded glass word. And so that is the salt marsh environment. Behind the salt marsh, as I said before, we have swamp paperbacks, the melaleucas, and then the end point would be the eucalyptus, the gum tree. mentioned uh, earlier was farmland and so would not only have had cattle but vehicles and this area was heavily used by motorbikes and cars and still bears the scars it's never fully recovered so we can see that the salt marsh is incomplete here the other thing that's affected the park is a bushfire so in 2015 a bushfire actually tore through a lot of the park and as you walk through, you'll see many of the burnt remains of the regrowth has been quite amazing. Um, it's really come on a lot and we'll end up replacing many of those old swamp paperbacks and become taller probably than the original ones. But this will be an ongoing risk that the park will face as climate change starts to accelerate. We will get more risk of bushfires, hotter bushfires, earlier bushfires. So the path here we've got two examples of the salt marsh plants that I was talking about, the um, shrubby glasswort and then down here the beaded glasswort, um, sometimes called samphire or salt bush. It's actually becoming very very popular with restaurants as an indigenous ingredient. A little bit salty for my liking. Um, and actually these plants, despite the fact that they're in a salt marsh, they don't tolerate salt very well. These plants are probably covered only a couple of times a month when we get some really high tides. Um, they're protected by the mangroves from the tidal intrusion. But the way that they deal with the salt is quite uh, intriguing. Is that they concentrate it in parts of their um, succulent sections and they turn bright red and then they will drop off and therefore that takes the salt out of the plant. Interestingly, those little red tips are very attractive to certain birds, particularly orange-bellied parrots. And if we know anything about those, they're actually critically endangered. So to know that we have a habitat here that would attract them in the winter time is really encouraging. So I mentioned before that the salt marsh area is covered by tides a couple of times a month. A couple of times a year, those tides are what we call king tides, so they are incredibly high. And that means that actually, in some cases, the whole of this area, the whole of the park is underwater. That 
causes a lot of damage to the paths, it causes erosion, and it causes uh, problems for the salt marsh if that um, area can't drain. So after some recent king tides, a couple of years ago, when there was some repair work needed to be done, Shire actually put in these raised areas which are drainage fence. So now the king tides are actually able to drain safely and go back out to the ocean, leave the park and the salt marsh free of the salt water and solve the problems that were being caused by the inundation. Again, with climate change, as we get sea level rise and more storm events, we're going to see more of the king tides and we're going to see higher king tides and that's another pressure that this beautiful area was going to face in the future. A little further into the park now we're starting to get into the area that creates the wetlands. You see there's a fair bit of water here in the park. This is uh, fresh water so that's a really important habitat. Lots of macro invertebrates that will be living in there and also important for many of species that inhabit the park. We know that we get spoonbills and black swans will be in here. We also get ibis and white-faced herons and a really cool bird of prey which hunts in the daytime, pretty unusual, and that's the swamp barrier. getting into the heart of Warrenjini Park now. It's an incredible environment, the whole area, the whole path stretches about four kilometres between Hastings and Jack's Beach. Um, it's a real joy to walk or cycle through here. The environment's really varied. Not only do we have the salt marsh, plants and the mangroves, but we've also got a heap of different sedges and grasses. Unfortunately, we also find uh, man-made uh, additions. So we have a little bit of litter here. Whilst this is organic, it's an orange peel. This is not normally um, a plant that you would find in this environment. That's not going to break down very, very quickly. So we can also add to the nutrient load, which can often turn the fresh water um, green or red with excess alcohol. Litter, even if you think it's totally natural and organic, please take it home with you from a place like
there are considerations on their environmental impacts and making sure that these industries do affect amazing environments that we have here. This whole area is part of a Ramsar listed site. And that's based on a treaty, an international agreement between about 180 countries that was signed on the 2nd of February in 1971 to protect wetlands of international significance. So these are wetlands for migratory bird species that spend uh, perhaps the summer here and then the winter in the northern hemisphere. So it's a really special area and it's lots of international significance. So having that boundary between the urban and the natural environment is a really difficult one to manage. over the creek that runs from inland up in Bitten down to Western Port. Low tide at the moment so exposed is the mud. Also lots of little holes so we've got shore crabs that are making uh, their way into those they can hear us. But also you might have noticed that there are some new mangrove seedlings which have tried to establish themselves in front of the much bigger older community of mangroves and some what looks like dead sticks poking up out of the mud they're actually mangrove roots they're called pneumatophores the mud is anaerobic that means that there's actually no available oxygen down there so plants need oxygen just like we do to attain that oxygen they actually have these aerial roots that stick up out and when the tide is out these roots are exposed once the tide comes back in all of those roots will be covered again the mangroves are pretty amazing they're one of the few plants that their seed actually germinates on the plant before it drops so it has a little root and a shoot ready to go and that happens around December, January time. It's actually a pretty harsh environment for a mangrove and it's really hard to establish themselves. So being ready to go as soon as you drop is a real advantage in this incredibly harsh environment. Many of the plants that are here in the park have really specific adaptations, particularly on their leaves. And we already talked about the salt marsh plants and how they excrete the salt. The mangroves do the same, they will excrete them out of their little pores, their little stomata on the underside of their leaf. And the other thing that mangrove leaves have is a very thick waxy covering on the top. This is to help cope with the very drying winds and the salty environment. life that we've seen and talked about and obviously all the macroinvertebrates and the frogs that are in the wetlands we also have some other animals in the park so we know that we have the endangered swamp skink here we've got red-bellied black snakes um, we have echidnas we have possums the wallabies and we also have an animal that's recently in the last few years returned to the park and that's a native water um, animal called the Rikali which is a really awesome success story. Comparing that though we also have some non-native animals, pest animals if you like and they consist of rabbits and foxes and there are programs to try and bring those numbers under control and the other thing that is uh, has been a significant issue um, is feral cats. So we're obviously very close to an urban environment so we do get the odd domestic cat that will come in here but we're really talking about cats that have been feral for many generations. They're often a lot larger than the domestic cats and they do cause a lot of damage. They come and hunt in here and will take out many of the 
indigenous mammals and reptiles and amphibians. So again, the authorities that manage this park do their best to try and remove all of the feral animals that we have in the park. So obviously a bit of a challenge um, and one of the reasons why dogs are not allowed in the park when people are walking is partly to help the native animals but also to have that program of eradication.